Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Paul the missionary in our continuing study of a history of Christianity. Uh, by the way, when you look at, the, uh, at this picture, I, I happened to take this picture, uh, uh, I think we were in Corinth at the time, and, and walking past, and, and the only thing that was there, the statue was actually broken, only the feet that you see here uh, were visible. And I, I paused and took a look, and then a second look, and thought about that passage that Paul quotes in Romans 10. It's actually a, a passage from, from, Jer from Isaiah where the Lord says, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the good news, of those that preach the gospel. And, and of course, we're looking at Paul the missionary, uh, who put a lot of miles on his sandals. So let's look at his travels. The story of Paul actually began, we, we noticed last time, <clears throat> with the martyrdom of Stephen, and young Saul, that was his, uh, his Jewish name, was there uh, in agreement with the death of Stephen. So we saw about how Saul had uh, obtained authorization to go from Jerusalem to Damascus to persecute the Christians there as well. And it was while he was on the Damascus road that he had an encounter with the risen Jesus, and he became Saul he went from being Saul the unbeliever to being Saul the Christian, and eventually he would be Saul the apostle. We know him as, by the name of Paul. And so we saw last week when we looked at his first missionary journey, uh, he and Barnabas going on their way from Salamis to Paphos uh, through the island of, of Cyprus, and then from, uh, from there to Perga. And as they moved inland, one of their traveling companions, a, a young fellow named John Mark, who had been the nephew of Barnabas, abandoned them there. When the, when the, tough got, when the going got tough, uh, he decided he wasn't tough enough, and, and he headed back home. They continued inland to Pisidian, Antioch, uh, to Iconium, to Lystra, to Derbe, and indeed the going was rather difficult, not only uh, besieged by robbers, but even uh, beatings at the hands of the Jews. But at the end of that time, they returned to uh, their home base at Antioch uh, and then had that council in Jerusalem. That Jerusalem council, which endorsed the, their missionary journey and endorsed the bringing of the Gentiles to faith, apart from circumcision, apart from them becoming Jewish. And it was realized, yes, Gentiles for Jesus really can be a thing. Now we begin the second missionary journey. It begins, it's going to be uh, uh, Paul, we're going by that name now, Paul and and Barnabas, but their traveling companion, Barnabas wants to, to give his, his nephew, John Mark, another, another try. Uh, he's ready again for action. And this time, there is a disagreement. We read that there was occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul would have nothing to do with Mark, at least at this point in history. Later on, he's going to have a change of heart, um, perhaps after Mark has proven himself. And so we see that Paul chose Silas, uh, another disciple, another Christian, and left being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So notice, the, instead of one missionary um, endeavor, you're going to have two going in two different directions. We read that Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. Notice he's, he's, they're following the route that they had gone previously. Uh, and there was a disciple there named Timothy. I can't help but wonder if, if Paul had met Timothy in that, in that initial missionary journey and now connects with him again. Uh, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were there in Lystra and Iconium. And so Paul takes this young Timothy, uh, because he's half Jewish and doesn't want to ask questions about, gee, uh, we, we know that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, but what about somebody that's only half Gentile and half Jewish? And Paul says, let's not even go there. And he circumcises Timothy, and then, then they continue to the west, and they pass through the uh, Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So they're moving through that territory but not allowed by the Holy Spirit to speak the word. 
And so as they continue westward, they came to Mysia and were trying to go into, they thought, well, maybe from here we'll go into Bithynia. Maybe the Spirit's going to let us speak there. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Here they are traveling (laughs) and not doing any missionary work at all, not because they're intimidated by the people, but because the Spirit is not allowing them. Now, it's while they are here that a vision appears to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so Paul awakes and Macedonia is is across the Hellespont, is is, uh, away from uh, Anatolia. It's actually in northern Greece. And so when he had seen the vision, immediately we saw it. By the way, notice that the The one telling the story, uh, the writer of the book of Acts, has now inserted himself into the story. It's no longer Paul did this. It's now we did this. We sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so, putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the next, on the day following, to Neapolis. And they come to Neapolis, the seaside city, but about ten miles inland is going to be the colony, the Roman colony of Philippi. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia. Notice the translators put in the word Roman there, but but they're helpful. Uh, A colony, it is a Roman colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. Now, if we come to Macedonia and we come to this leading city of Philippi, Philippi, as we said, was a, a colony that had been planted after one of the epic battles during the Roman Civil War. Uh, we come to, to the ruins there. It's, it's not an inhabited city today. It's, it's still in ruins. Um, to Philippi. And when we go out, to the gates of the, out, out of the gates of the city, as Paul eventually did, come there. Uh, here we were looking at the forum and, and the theater and all of the things that we would see there. We go outside the gates of the city and there's a Roman graveyard. Today, there's a baptistry there commemorating what took place. Uh, by this place of death, there was a, the, the river that fed the city went by here. And at this location, some women from the city made it their habit to come out here and they would make it a place of prayer. And Paul comes and meets this woman's Bible study and he tells them about Jesus. And one of the women, a uh, a seller of purple, a businesswoman by the name of Lydia, becomes the first convert here in Europe. And so Paul has, with this tiny little beginning, Lydia and her family are baptized, and others begin to hear the word. And Paul begins to preach. Now, not everybody wants to hear this. For example, uh, there is in the city a demon-possessed girl, uh, a slave girl, whose masters are using her demon possession in order to to foretell the future and to to make prophecies. And they're making quite a bit of money off of her, money that disappears when Paul casts the demon out of the girl, and suddenly she's just a normal slave girl. And so the these, these slave owners have Paul arrested and beaten and thrown into the Philippian jail. Uh, that night, as Paul and Silas are both in jail, uh, they're, they're singing, and all of a sudden there is an earthquake. Is it chance? Is it supernatural? We're not actually told. But the Philippian jailer, uh, thinking that his, his, uh, those under his charges escape, is ready to, to kill himself. And Paul cries out from the, from the jail, don't hurt yourself, we're still here. And he comes and he releases them and he takes them home to take care of their, of their wounded where they've been beaten. And he shares the gospel, Paul shares the gospel with them. And this Philippian jailer, name unknown, and his entire family believe and become part of the church. Well, the next day, they, he, he brings them back into the jail. And Paul says, you know, you ought to send word out to the authorities uh, that the one that they've arrested, the one that they've beaten, is a Roman citizen. Now, that's a very serious charge because you're not allowed to beat a Roman citizen. Um, and so they, they send word, well, well you, in that case, you can go. We're sorry for that. And he says, oh, no, no, no. You beat me and put me here. You need to come here publicly and apologize. And he's sort of putting them through the ringer so that they will be a little more hesitant 
to persecute the other Christians that are here in the same city. And so they do. They they invite him. Pretty please, will you leave our jail and 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 not report this to the authorities? Of course, they are the local authorities. Uh, and Paul, he he go. He says, okay, I will leave, and and he leaves the prison. But then he stays in the church for a few days just to to make it known. I'm with these folks. Don't be messing with them, or else a, a report might get to Rome, back to Rome what you did, and then you would be in a lot of trouble. Paul eventually leaves Philippi, and moving westward, he comes to Thessalonica, uh, still a big city today. Uh, he goes to the synagogue in Thessalonica and, and is there for several weeks sharing the gospel. But after a while, no, they don't want anything to do with this message of Jesus. And so he leaves Thessalonica as well. And from Thessalonica next, he will go to Berea. Here's, remember, he's walking all the way. Here, here's that statue that we talked about at the beginning of our series of lectures. From Thessalonica on a clear day, uh, you can't see it all the time, you can actually see Mount Olympus. Uh, so here they were in the shadow of the Greek gods, and yet preaching the gospel uh, to this pagan city, to the Jews that were there, to the Gentiles that were there, all that would listen. And indeed, Thessalonica is going to see uh, another church that will be formed and grow there. But from Thessalonica, now they go to the little tiny town of Berea. Uh, it was a tiny town then. It was, it's still a little tiny town even today up in the foothills. Uh, and here they come to the synagogue. And the people in the synagogue, uh, they hear the gospel and they say, gee, we want to study and see if this is really true. Uh, they don't just reject the gospel out of hand. Instead, many of them believe and they continue studying the scriptures, wanting to know if God has sent a Messiah, we want to know about it. Here's the passage, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Notice you've got, you have Jews believing, and Gentiles believing, and women believing, and men believing. And the church continues to grow and to prosper. From here, Paul is going to move down to Athens. Um, he, he, this, at this point, he's taken an ocean voyage, but you can't sail right up to Athens because it's inland. There he, he preaches the gospel at the Areopagus under the shadow of the, of the Acropolis. We've already talked about that, so I'm not going to uh, retell the story of how Paul uh, shares the gospel and speaks of the resurrection. Uh, limited success, so he's going to leave Athens. He's going to leave Athens and continue on his way, now coming finally to Corinth. To Corinth these days, you actually have to go to a canal. The canal wasn't there. It was a narrow isthmus about four miles wide. Um, it, that the, the canal was dug in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, so nowadays you cross over a bridge come to the ruins of Corinth. This, uh, uh, and this was the seat of the proconsul. Athens was not the seat of government. Corinth was the seat of the local Roman government. And here under the shadow of the Acro-Corinth, that, that big uh, uh, area to the north, the Greek city would always have a high place, and, and Corinth was like that. It had uh, the great Acro-Corinth that overlooked the city, but the, the city was on the plain uh, at the edge of where you had the isthmus. Uh, in fact, you can see the, you can see both sides of the sea from Corinth. Just, just look to the north, and it's there. And here in Corinth, we read that Paul found a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, Claudius was the Roman emperor, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now, now uh, in the writings of Tacitus, Tacitus talk, and I, I think Suetonius gives us the same information, they talk about how, how Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome because of an issue that had arisen over somebody by the name of Christus. Now, Christus sounds a lot like Christ. Uh, apparently, there were, there were Christians in Rome, and there were Jews in Rome, and, and the issue had begun to ferment an argument, and it had grown so stringent that Claudius, the Roman emperor, said, that's it, I'm done with you all, all Jews leave Rome. And he came to them, 
And because he, that is Paul, was of the same trade, that is, they were tent makers, we're going to see that explanation in just a moment, he stayed with them, for they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. Uh, And so this becomes the nucleus of a new church that will be formed here in Corinth. Now, uh, it was Paul's regular process where he would uh, initially go to the synagogue. So he does this here in Corinth. In Corinth, uh, there was a synagogue. It's interesting. We actually haven't found the synagogue, but we found a a, uh, a pillar that has a a uh, a Jewish symbol, a menorah on it. Several, I think there's three of them on the on this on this pillar, uh, indicating that this was the place where the synagogue was. We don't know exactly uh, where that came from, but we read that Crispus, the synagogue leader, uh, heard the gospel and he became a Christian. Well, that's rather problematic because the rest of the synagogue uh, didn't want to have a Christian as their synagogue leader. So evidently, they voted him out of office and they were going to vote a new synagogue leader. Um, and so Crispus has joined with Paul. He's, he's joined this new church, become a member of this new church. And it's not long before the synagogue has Paul brought up on charges, and they bring it before the local proconsul, that is the governor, not just of, of Corinth, but of the entire area of Greece. Um, the, the, and they bring him to the bema, the, that is the judgment seat. This big platform is where this judgment would, would take place. And by now we have a new synagogue leader. His name is Sosthenes. And so he's bringing up the charges before Gallio, the proconsul. Uh, This also helps us uh, determine exactly when this is taking place because we know from Roman records that Gallio was the proconsul in the year 51 AD. So we can actually date this to the very year. Uh, So Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, brings charges against uh, against Paul and the other Christians. uh, And as the charges are read, Gallio says, wait a minute, uh, this ha- doesn't have anything to do with Rome. This hasn't ha- doesn't have anything to do with the peace of the city. This is between two, Ju- two groups of Jewish people that are in disagreement about what their Judaism looks like. I don't want any part of this. And he throws the case out of court. And then just to make it stick, he has his guards, his soldiers, take Sosthenes, and they give him a rather royal beating. Um, Now, it's interesting because the next time we're going to hear from Sosthenes is many years later when Paul writes an epistle to the church at Corinth. And he begins his epistle, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul calls as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Sosthenes, our brother, did you hear it? Sosthenes becomes a Christian, just like Christmas. I wonder who they got to be the next synagogue official. Well, they probably were getting a, a bit low on candidates. Be that as it may, uh, Paul, from this point on, is going to, he's going to leave Corinth. He's going to travel to, and he comes to Ephesus. Uh, They came to Ephesus, Acts Acts chapter 18, verse 19, uh, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Of course, that was his, his regular modus operandi. And when they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. So this first visit to Ephesus is a very short one. Uh, You can think of it as a maybe a fact-finding mission. He speaks briefly, but then he leaves. And he's going to leave Ephesus. And now he will travel uh, by ship to Caesarea. And from Caesarea, he will return to Antioch from where he began. And we've just completed a very long second missionary journey. But we no sooner sooner have we been there that we start on the third missionary journey where Paul comes a second time to Ephesus. And this time he will be there for, for more than a year. And so now we come to Ephesus, uh, another major city. Notice Most of Paul's ministry is going to be at these major metropoli, these major cities. And Ephesus is no exception. In fact, Ephesus contains some of the most beautiful ruins that you can find anywhere in the ancient world. This entire city, uh, notice the the mosaics that have been, uh, that are still in place. Uh, This is a sidewalk from Ephesus. And the the sidewalks were were hand assembled in these little tiny bits of colored rock uh, that rendered the even the streets were uh, were uh, wonderful artistic patterns, and so Paul comes to this very wealthy city of Ephesus, and here 
This becomes his base of operations as Paul preaches the gospel here, and then the, the word goes out from Ephesus to the surrounding cities so that we're going to see churches popping up all throughout the region. Now, like normal, Paul always begins in the synagogue, uh, but it's not long before they say, no, you can't be here anymore. We don't want to hear about Jesus as the Messiah. And so he leaves the synagogue and he goes across the street next door to the house of Titius Justice. Uh, apparently there was some house or school there. And I can sort of imagine just sort of changing the sign Bible studies here from the synagogue to across the street to, to the house of Titius Justice. And now he begins teaching here. It's not long. Not long before it has created a stir, uh, not among the Jews, but now among the Greeks, where there is a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made shrines of Artemis. You're seeing a, a statue of Artemis. Uh, Ephesus is filled with them. We have found bunches and bunches and bunches of these idols, these statues. Some of them are very small. Some of them are life-size and even bigger. Um, and he was making a a, uh, a great living, not just him, but all of the craftsmen. And he calls for a meeting, and it turns into something of a riot. Um, uh, here they are uh, making making idols for the, the temple of Artemis, which was considered to be one of the wonders of the world uh, at that day and age. And they, they gather together as a group, but really as a mob, coming to the, to the theater, the theater at Ephesus, a uh, massive theater, and Paul hears that they are gathered here, and he says, oh, great, I can go give the gospel to them there. Uh, if, if you stand at the basis of the theater, you can speak, and everybody will hear you. Uh, and his friends say, no, 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 they will rip you apart. Uh, and so instead, they sneak him out of the city, and instead, uh, the the city treasurer goes out to address them and says, you know, uh, the Romans could look at this as a revolt. They will come down here and, and they will put an end to, to it and you. You don't want to be doing this. And, and he calms the crowd and Paul goes on his way. When Paul leaves Ephesus, instead of going back, he makes a circuit around the Aegean, revisiting the various churches that he had planted before. And then... And then returning in the same route, coming not to Ephesus, but to nearby Miletus, because he's actually on a mission to head back to Caesarea and to head back to Jerusalem. And so he sends a message for the elders of the church at Ephesus to come and meet him. And they travel to meet him, and there he gives his closing words to them, um, where he tells them, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He calls them to be overseers, to be pastors. That's the word shepherd, just means uh, one who shepherds, one who pastors. Uh, and, and so he charges these elders with these words. And then after having met with them, he continues on his way to Caesarea, and from Caesarea, now comes to Jerusalem, where the story is going to take a very different turn. For it is in Jerusalem, as Paul has come here for the Feast of Pentecost. Remember, uh, our story started uh, in the book of Acts with the Feast of Pentecost. And now we've come full circle. Paul comes to Jerusalem, and, and it's known that Paul has had some traveling companions, uh, and some of them have been Gentiles. And uh, when you come to Jerusalem, notice there is a wall around the, of course, you've got the, uh, the big course that you're seeing with all the colonnades, but then around the temple uh, structure and the inner courts, you have a low wall, and at, the, at this wall, there would be a gate every so often with a plaque written in Greek. I suppose some would be written in Latin, but we're looking at the Greek one here. Uh, and, and it warns all who can read it no Gentiles beyond this point. No Gentiles allowed to go past this dividing wall upon pain of death. Well, Paul is Jewish, so he has gone in. He's left his Gentile friends outside. But other Jews see him inside, and they know he was traveling with Gentiles. So they, they jump to the conclusion, he must have brought Gentiles into the temple. Now, it's simply not true, but the word gets out, and the rumor uh, grows and develops, and a, a mob uh, grabs Saul, uh, Paul, 
and they're not sure what to do with him. They're pulling him this way and that way. And on the north side of the temple complex, you see the four towers there. That is the Fortress Antonia, where there is a Roman garrison. And the Romans are able to keep an eye on things that are happening in the temple. And they look down there, and there's a big riot developing with one man in the middle. Oh, we have to put an end to this riot. So they rush down, the soldiers rush down into the temple compound, and they arrest the one in the middle. That happens to be Paul. Uh, and they, uh, he he's actually says, you know, perhaps I can put an end to this. And uh, they allow him to address the crowd uh, in Hebrew, as it turns out. Uh, they don't know that he speaks Hebrew, but he does. A- and he addresses them and he gives them the gospel. And they're fine with that until he gets to the point about how, how God had called him to go and give the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, they can't have any of that. And so the riot is all ready to break out again. And so the Roman soldiers bring him up to the fortress Antonia, and they're ready to give him a beating, but Paul now reminds them, by the way, do you know you have a a Roman citizen? Really? You were a Roman citizen? And and the garrison commander says, you know, I spent a lot of money to become a citizen. And Paul says, well, no, I was actually born as a citizen. And that puts him in an entirely new light. So they're going to transfer him uh, the Jewish uh, the Jewish people, actually, the Jewish rulers, I should say, actually have a plot to try to assassinate him, and, and the plot is uncovered. Uh, and so they transfer him by night. They transfer him down to the coastal city of Caesarea, which is the seat of the proconsul. Well, not a proconsul. Israel's not big enough to have a proconsul. Uh, it's the seat of the local procurator. The proconsul is up in Syria. Uh, and uh, And here he is brought before the the procurator, whose name is Felix. Uh, And so here at Caesarea, he meets with Felix. Uh, You can still go to the ruins of Caesarea even today. It's a marvelous city where, in fact, the theater at at Caesarea is is used for modern-day concerts even. Um, But in this case, uh, Felix meets with Paul, uh, and he keeps him under arrest, hoping that Paul will pay a bribe. Uh, I've talked in an earlier class about the reputation that procurators have. They're they're really in it for the money. They're, They're really in it for collecting for their retirement fund. And so he's hoping that Paul will generate some money and pay off a bribe, and then, then he will release him. But Paul doesn't have the money, and so Paul is there for two years as a prisoner at Caesarea. And while he is here, perhaps he is beginning to write some of those epistles, those prison epistles uh, of which we read in the New Testament. Well, at the end of that time, uh, there, uh, uh, Felix is going to be removed from office. Uh, he's not going to last that long, and he will be replaced by Festus. And uh, in this change of offices, there comes a very distinguished visitor, a King Agrippa and his sister Berniki. Now, King Agrippa, and we've heard that name before, perhaps, uh, because King Agrippa is the great-grandson of Herod the Great. His father had been Agrippa I, uh, mentioned in Acts chapter 12. And uh, so Agrippa is here with his uh, sister, Beniki, uh, and also uh, his other sister, Drusilla, is there because she's married to Felix. Uh, and Felix is the outgoing procurator, and Festus is the incoming procurator. And as they are meeting together, the subject of this, of this Roman citizen by the name of Paul comes up, and they arrange to have him uh, come and meet them, have sort of an unofficial hearing, uh, and Paul gets a chance to give them all the gospel. And, and in the conversation, Paul in particular sets his sight on Agrippa II and says, oh, Agrippa, I know that you're a student of the scriptures. As I speak to you about the Messiah, you're going to get this. And at one point in the conversation, Agrippa says, you, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul says, oh, I'd much rather than almost persuade you. I wish that you were just like me, except for these chains, that you were just like me in every respect, coming to know the Lord. Well, at the end of that time, they all confer and they agree that Paul has done nothing worthy of being put to death, uh, but he has appealed to the Caesar, and so to the Caesar he must go. And now Paul is set forth on a ship uh, that first goes to Cyprus, and then from there, past Crete, it actually puts in for Crete, uh, but then is caught in a storm and is driven halfway across the Mediterranean where there is a shipwreck on the island of Malta. 
Um, this very unorthodox way of traveling does not put an end to their travels. They will uh, eventually catch a, another ship from here, and Paul will come safely finally to Rome, where he is awaiting trial. The book of, the book of Acts ends on this note, where Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31, last two verses of the book of Acts, where he, Paul, stayed two full years in his own rented quarters. He is awaiting his hearing before the emperor and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. Now, throughout the entire story, we've heard time and time and time again where Christians were hindered, where they were arrested, where they were beaten, where they were shipwrecked, but the gospel could not be hindered. And our story closes on that note of victory as the gospel continued to be unhindered and unchained as it is even today.